Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Bibliotech On Air. Today we have a book talk episode for y'all. We recently finished reading Mindhunter Inside the FBI's Elite Serial Crime Unit by John Douglas and Mark Olshaker. It is available on Cloud Library in both ebook and audiobook formats. Um, so just a quick content warning this book is about serial killers and profiling so of course there will be grisly details graphic details about various murders um so if that's not your thing then by all means take this as your warning so let's go ahead and read a quick summary about the book mind hunter inside the fbi's elite serial crime unit by john douglas and mark olshaker is an autobiography published in 1995 that chronicles Mr. Douglas's life and his illustrious career with the FBI. In particular, the book details Douglas's development of psychological profiling as a tool for law enforcement through an extensive study that he conducted with his colleagues in the Behavioral Science Unit. Uh, so before we get into the questions um, that we have to structure our book talk today, we did have two individuals, uh, two listeners, give us their thoughts on the book. So one of them said, I thought it was interesting that John explained how it's mostly men who commit these crimes, how all serial killers are men, but I don't think he thoroughly explained why it's white men. It's usually abuse and trauma in childhood that form serial killers, but why is it usually white men? What racial, social, and or economic factors affect white men that can be targeted in addressing mental health and recovery and education? I also thought it was interesting, the structure of the book, like how each story in Serial Killer was presented somewhat chronological, but really the similarities is what linked the story of each killer. It was a bit confusing, but also pretty cool because each story just flowed from one to the next, and then his own life slash FBI stories were weaved into it. Overall, it was a great read for anyone who likes psychology and who enjoys re trying to understand the complexities of why people do what they do. I don't call myself a true crime fan, but I was fascinated by the science behind profiling. Nice. Hmm. Very nice excerpt. I'll go ahead and read the next expert that we received. It says, John states that prison is better at keeping serial killers off the streets more than psychiatric institutions, especially since many had already been treated and went under the radar of psychiatric help. After hearing the atrocities and how many don't feel remorse, but rather enjoy reliving their killings by talking to John in his interviews, can someone advocate for prison reform and at the same time agree that prison is the best place to keep serial killers, especially if many of these killers are unrecoverable unre due to possibly being triggered again and unable to undo the traumas of their childhood? I don't know much about prison reform, but through that, recovery is possible for anyone. Interesting. Some of the points that we'll definitely be bringing up today. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. What were y'all's overall thoughts on the book? People are terrible. I know. <laughs> and that goes without say, for sure. It goes without. But um, profiling, it's definitely a lot more than just like, you know, taking guesses of, um, mm -hmm. you know, oh, it's it, there's so much behind it. Like the one reader said, there's a whole science behind it. And the fact that it was kind of like underrated at first, um, kind of discarded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But afterwards you see that pretty much everyone and their moms reaching out to douglas and his team like hey we have this case mm -hmm. can y'all help us can y'all help us you know it got to the point where he was like overloaded with cases exactly and he you know? suffered like just a big old health breakdown but it's it's fascinating because a lot of like like some of the things he would describe it would just be a quick like little blurb about the serial killer and instantly he would just have like this you know they're white they're ex-military. Yeah. They drive divorced. this kind of car. Divorced. I, divorced siblings. five times. That blew my mind. I was like, how in the world did he just immediately on the spot just start jotting down in his mm -hmm. notes, like yeah. profiling the person? I don't know. That was crazy. I mean, obviously years of experience, but yeah. it's just, man. I did like that it gave us a history of him and, you know, some of the things that influenced his ability to profile. It made it easier to understand why he's able to write up a quick profile like that. Um, and maybe not even quick. It might think, take an hour like, or two. Like, yeah, it's, for the book, it's probably, you know, yeah. condensed, but still. Yeah. Still Like, for example, he started off, um, like, profiling bank robbers. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I found really interesting is how a lot of these, in the in the early on in the book, um, he mentions that these these individuals, these serial killers, they lean towards like being involved in the cases, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but they also had like a specific car. I don't oh, remember the Volkswagen car. Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah. <laughs> and like it was quite a few serial killers who had the same car. And it gets to that like even to that minute detail. 
that's I just wonder why. Maybe it was just a ch- pop, cheap, popular car. I mean, it was kind of like the seventies and eighties. It's definitely, yeah, you know, a popular car. But also, it might just be such an unassuming car because, yeah. not to you know get stereotypical, but when you think of someone driving a Beetle, who are you going to think of driving a Beetle? True, teenage true. girl, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So you know, no, maybe like Corollas. <laughs> maybe you think like you know, oh, this man pulled over in his Beetle. Maybe it belongs to his wife, his daughter, you yeah. know. Okay, I might feel a bit safe, which mm-hmm. slightly going yeah. a little off tangent. Well, not tangent, but it's still in relation. The amount of trust people had back in the 70s. <sighs> like, my you can God. just hitchhike, yeah. catch a ride with someone, no issues. Like, oh, my God. I oh, know, my just... goodness. It's, it's terrible. We're so ingrained now to be like... Don't take rides from strangers. Yeah. Don't talk to anyone you know. If someone knocks on the door, shut the lights yeah. off and everything. Don't but, make long eye contact. Like, <laughs> I don't. It's just, you know, I, I get it. It was a different time, but my God. It's crazy. It really is the way it's changed. Yeah, people had too much trust in, in it and on everybody. Um, but another thing that I, I kind of didn't like about the book was that I, I actually didn't really like the structure. I felt like it was very overwhelming for myself Mm -hmm. um it's laden with facts and laden with information you know on the victims um on the serial killers and how they did their crimes um and it's just really bam 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 bam, Mm -hmm. bam, bam, right back to back which you know can be a little overwhelming not because of the content but because it's just a lot of information Mm -hmm. it's hard to remember for myself personally um and so that's kind of one of the things that I didn't like. Yeah, it was just very fast. It was literally yeah. one serial killer to the next. I was like, what? Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, it's definitely, like, for us, you know, I guess casual, non, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. law enforcement people, remembering all these details, that's that's so much to take in. But for people who do this every day, like John Douglas did, mm-hmm. for him, it's probably just normal. Like, you know, he has to remember all these details. He yeah. has to remember yeah. dates and names and just yeah such small exactly. things and for him it's just kind of a touch like you know of or i guess a taste of how busy he was because mm-hmm. he was being hit up by everyone mm-hmm. so for us seeing this just what's in the book imagine what he didn't talk about like, yeah. actually yeah that's a that's a really good point that you make it's really the whole book is i mean a testament of like how he exactly what you're saying how he thinks you know a lot of information i'm gonna give it here it is. It inspired a show, Mindhunters, mm-hmm. on Netflix as well, which is really good. Canceled. So I don't know how good it was, but I really liked I it. I mean, it was very enjoyed by the general public. Yeah. <laughs> like anybody who talks about it says it was a really good show. Um, And so there's actually now, and he talks about this in the book, that there's there's four different types of serial killers, right? There's thrill seekers slash hedonistic, power and control, mission oriented, and then a visionary. And so I just want to give like maybe an example of each of those types so an example of like a thrill seeker slash hedonistic serial killer is jeffrey dahmer an example of an individual that exerts power and control uh ted bundy uh mission oriented uh joseph franklin and then a visionary uh david berkowitz uh son of sam um and i believe in the book he does speak about son of sam uh he confessed to eight murders he was suspected of many arsons one of the things also that i found interesting about the book was the way these individuals get gratification um it can be like you know we see with power and control and then they take advantage of an individual sexually uh by force or um i believe there is one thing that left that one of the individuals it was an arsonist and he would do gratification while the fire was going Mm mm-hmm and, right right and mm-hmm. i i guess that's maybe like a thrill seeker type of killer i mean that's one of the signs right? yeah mm-hmm. yeah that's another thing right there's three uh signs within a child or a youth right what were they it was arson bedwetting and cruelty, cruelty to animals yeah yeah um he also did state at the end of the book that it's more like people are made made Mm -hmm. not born there's a specific instance uh that happens in an individual's life uh that lead them to be who they are like nature versus nurture nature Mm -hmm. versus nurture yeah and we will be back after these messages have you checked out interplay learning yet 
This resource has been building better training, better careers, and better lives for their customers and their employees. The award-winning online and VR training for the essential skill trades is scalable and more effective than traditional training methods. With topics such as HVAC, electrical, plumbing, and more, learning technical skills and becoming certified has never been easier. And now we're back. first question that we had that we wanted to discuss was Douglas worked on several high profile cases during his career such as the Atlanta child murders and the Green River Killer which case stood out to you the most and why I felt like they all stood out to me I felt like after reading each case back to back I had to like put the book down and just okay let me go let me go for a walk this is a lot of just graphic um, details of all these murders and all these serial killers as well they were all just so unique in their own way and this, I feel like this is unrelated, but something that also stood out to me that he said was that it was hard for him to profile like generic killings or stabbings, you know? Mm -hmm. And he was like, I, it has to be something really like grotesque and unique in order for him to be able to profile it immediately. Which, right. I don't know. For, to me, that's just wild to think about. Um, Cause they're all like, no case was the same. They were all just so different in mm -hmm. the way that they planned it out the reason behind it you know that's what that was my take on it i mean that's that's fair it's easier to you know sort out the details when you have this just insane killer who's mm -hmm. leaving you know calling cards and stuff mm -hmm. opposed you know, to like say just someone who got stabbed on a subway yeah <laughs> i don't know as far as like killers that stood out again a lot of these guys stood out but uh reading about ed kemper and just how intelligent he was and just the gravity of what he did mm -hmm. and yeah. he did have he was one of the ones that was able to like trick psychiatrists mm -hmm. and psychologists mm -hmm. like um i'm good you know like i'm fine and then of course a couple years later it was just so methodical because he killed he started off with killing his grandparents he got treatment and stuff was able to you know reintegrate into society got a job as a state highway patrolman mm -hmm. and then through that is how he was picking up his victims mm -hmm. like my god and then what he would do just yeah, super gruesome yeah. and it all was just linked back to how his mother treated him yeah and his mother was just like seen in the community as like this wonderful woman who would help other people mm -hmm. but she treated her son like an absolute monster because he was you know like six nine mm -hmm. he, he was a big guy mm -hmm. he was a big guy so that was that was definitely fascinating and tough to read about <laughs> yes he was also very articulate mm -hmm. right um he he helped uh, a lot with like john douglas and in the interviews that they were doing things like that he also stated too um yeah i'm not i shouldn't be let out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't be let out because if i'm let out you know i'm probably gonna do what i'm gonna do again mm -hmm. um so that's pretty crazy one of the killers that stood out to me was Larry Jean Bell. Um, he was a serial killer in South Carolina. And the two individuals that he killed was Sherry Faye Smith and Deborah May Helmick. Um, but then, he, so Sherry Faye had a sister and a family, all who very much loved her. Um, and he would taunt them by calling the family and speaking with Sherry's sister um, but he also made Sherry write her last will and testament, and then he mailed it to the family, right? And in the book, they do read the testament. Um, I, I do remember that. Uh, but then also Deborah, Deborah Helmick was only nine years old, mm -hmm. was only nine years old. And just something in his brain was just wired where I'm doing this. This is okay. This is normal. Um, whereas like Ed Kemper, you see him be like, yeah, I'm doing these things. They're not okay, mm -hmm. and I shouldn't be let out. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess the age of, of Deborah um, is what left us like a, a lasting impression on me because he even stated um, to, his, to Sherry's sister when he spoke to her on the phone because at the time they were trying to trace the call and mm -hmm. it needed to be a 15-minute phone call at least. Mm -hmm. And so they were... Tr they, the, the investigators are trying to keep him on the phone long enough so they could trace the call. 
but at one point he tells uh sherry's sister um i'm gonna get you sooner or later it's gonna happen um and thankfully it didn't um and uh but yeah that one was crazy that one was really cra- all of them were really crazy <laughs> yeah and kemper's was just insane son of sam uh yeah was another individual i w- my dog. yeah i want i want to say that at least in the show uh the, the two individuals that play uh like john douglas right i want to say they get him to admit that it was all yeah up. they even uh talk about that in oh, the perfect. book part of perfect. his profiling was to be like um i don't there was so much to go on but basically he he um straight up tells david berkowitz like you know cut the crap man yeah. like you know the yeah, dog didn't tell you to do it and he's like yeah you're right like he straight up says it it's crazy i mean like just thinking the way that he spoke to these serial killers too and how he yeah. had to think about the way that he was like had like, to approach them yes like i remember the one that stood out to me the most was when he was talking to who was it was it the Spec. one where he had to do like um kind of like locker room slang yes when he it was a serial killer i just wrote down here spec but he said he had to get really gruesome and so a direct quote was like um when he just walked into the room just to set this, the tone of the conversation he says you know what he did your guy he killed a uh, the p word and some of those looked pretty good he took eight good pieces of away from the rest of us you think that's fair and so that set the tone for the entire conversation that he was going to have with that serial killer and he was like i looked to my co-worker and he's just absolutely uncomfortable with that didn't want to get down to the killer's level like that uh but um he was like you have to you have to do some of these guys Mm -hmm. um and then what i thought was really interesting as well was that the serial killer he was talking to spec um when he's listening to him just speak in this really gruesome boy he, he that he shakes his head chuckles and he says you guys are effing crazy it must be a fine line that separates you from me so that quote like really stood out to me from the book cuz it's true especially since the way he says that he has to get into the mind of the serial killer and thinks the way that they think what am i going to be scared for if i was in this interrogation room you know right. like when he mentioned that one, everyone has a rock uh, yes the rock when uh i forgot do you remember which serial killer that was um that was one i don't remember the name but that was another one that's like probably a big standout he was the one that killed the little drum major girl yeah um but, but he, yeah because they found the bloody rock yeah, that he used to kill her and they had it in the interrogation room so that way they can see the way that he's going to react to it right I, I don't think it was the actual rock right they like staged it i thought it was or, the actual oh. rock <laughs> well but yeah it's just it's just crazy to think every everyone does have their rock and mm-hmm. you just got to think about what you're going to do to get the, the get person to crack mm-hmm. yeah another question that um i'd like to ask that we have written down is that it says the book touches on controversial topics such as the death penalty mental health and rehabilitation how did douglas's experiences and opinions on these subjects influence his work and interactions with criminals he this guy was completely pro death penalty Mm -hmm. which was shocking to me because before this um i had i had my own thoughts you know as i was just thinking to myself about the death penalty and then some reform that some people are having to go to because of some people wrongly accused mm-hmm. you know things like mm-hmm. that but then reading this book and then how he was talking to some of his co-workers where he was like oh yeah i was able to change their minds on the death penalty you know mm-hmm. things like that yeah, yeah it's i mean the the things this guy's experienced it's understandable you know yes it's understandable um, it's definitely understandable and i think when you're dealing with individuals that have no remorse they detach themselves from society who are antisocial, narcissistic, who relish in their killings. I mean, how could you not be pro death penalty, mm-hmm. really? An individual would have to be very firm in, I guess, their beliefs um, to stay like anti death penalty. Um, it would, I'll definitely say for myself, it'll take more than a, just reading this book for me to be pro death penalty. Mm-hmm. Um, this book really allows, I think, for the question to be asked um that nature versus nurture kind of uh question do you think people do you think individuals like serial killers 
are born that way or do you think they're made that way truly believe made that way you know uh especially everything that he says in the book seeing how they were growing up uh a lot of these serial killers the way they were treated by their mothers Mm -hmm. and then when they when they specifically um target women and Mm -hmm. the way that they even leave their bodies behind it Mm -hmm. means it ties into their past you know something that they went through uh and then like that one serial killer who did all those degrading things to the female's body Mm -hmm. and then he like defecated next to her but then he covered it up you know like his own he was ashamed of his own you know the defecation yeah it's just crazy and he was just tying it all back to his past as well with the way that he was raised i i truly believe that they're they're made right it always seems to tie back to some kind of mo Mm -hmm. and i i think based off of this like at least the ones he talks about like a lot of these you can point to definitely being Mm -hmm. made yeah versus you know just born like that am i saying someone can be someone could be born with Mm -hmm. you know the capacity to kill Mm -hmm. we don't know but Mm -hmm. going solely based off of the book it see it points definitely more like they're made Mm -hmm. this is how they're made because they even talk about how at some point there was a study and they found a certain kind of gene in serial killers mm-hmm. but they were able to like yeah. completely disprove yeah. that down the line and they were like well we okay tried. then <laughs> yeah at least we explored it yeah <laughs> yeah i definitely think it's a, a combination of the two things um i think an indiv- like genetics are just a crazy topic mm-hmm. um and i could definitely I, I i do think an individual can be born that way like you're saying rosanna uh, but for the individuals that were spoken about in the book, there's like y'all said, there's always a specific instance, either a beat like some type of trauma mm-hmm. um, that they endure that m- motivates and facilitates chemical imbalances in their brain or to begin doing uh, these deviant behaviors like arson and bedwetting and um, that last one cruelty, with the cruelty, to cruelty, to animals. cruelty to animals. And not to say this justifies them yeah. in any way. Like, yeah. it absolutely no. it does, does not. not. Yeah, it's, for sure. Yeah. But it's part of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. definitely. It is. It always is. Like, there's this one YouTuber I enjoy watching. I think her name's Bailey Sarian. And she, anytime she talks about her true crimes, she always goes into the backstory of the serial killers. And she gets backlash for that. Like, a lot of people are like, oh, you mentioned that this serial killer was into this so are you saying like all people who are into that are going to become serial killers you know it's just like no it's just you just have to speak about the past uh, like about where they came up to understand, to understand them to understand the case yeah. more and to understand them more like unless you're going out of your way to make them sympathetic mm-hmm. you know like how some of these serial killers have these fan you know fan oh, these God, crazy fans who are absolutely yes. like topic. Uh, that's yeah that's, that's definitely like off topic but that's like you know there's people like that and i would say in this book you really don't see that like obviously douglas he's a professional mm-hmm. he mm-hmm. talks about their past mm-hmm. but in a way that's you know it's like textbook yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's textbook it's information it's facts mm-hmm. yeah um it's too understand the profile exactly of the ser- serial killer not to justify exactly you're actions. not justifying you're not making them sympathetic it's just simply like this matter of fact this is what they did this is why they yeah. probably yeah. did it mm-hmm. and we will be back after these messages Summer is still rolling and so is Around the World with Bibliotech. Check out our summer reading program for the year 2023. That'll run from June 5th to August 31st. Check the events calendar at our website, fairbibliotech.org, so you can visit many countries for free. Check out Japan, Greece, Costa Rica, Mexico, and more. And now we're back. Yeah, I would say overall it's a good book. Uh, it's uh, it's a, a nonfiction book, obviously. Um, I haven't read a nonfiction book in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would really like to end it with um, an opinion that an individual had um, while on their book review of the book. Um, so they stated, you cannot be a good person until you know how much evil you contain within you. Um, and I feel like, I don't know, I just kind of want to throw that out there. What do y'all think about a statement like that? Uh, I don't know if I've explored the evil within me enough then to know that I'm a good person. I mean, I guess it's kind of 
just realizing like the extent of bad you could do and deciding I guess just kind of grappling with that every day like do I do the inherently good thing or Mm -hmm. can I just like it's what do they with instinct and just you know or not instinct what is that trend going on right now mainstream where it says oh their inner thoughts oh their invasive thoughts yeah it's like intrusive intrusive thoughts thoughts yeah one that day you know where it's like everybody kind of has those you know weird little thoughts that you have in your head but of course you're gonna act on it yeah like am i gonna set this place on fire i (laughs) have that thought but i'm not gonna do it like (laughs) yeah yeah. i'm like okay what will happen if i do that it's like you're driving like what if i just crash into this tree drive off the highway it's just i mean i guess so relating that to that quote it makes more sense for me because i'm like yeah i mean we all have those thoughts those intrusive mm-hmm. thoughts where it's like what if i do this what right if- like this person pissed me off am i gonna deck them in the face right now but i'm not gonna do it there's and some why? people who might impulsively do why, it why why but... am i not gonna do it though <laughs> or you know is it because i know the consequences <laughs> of what's gonna happen or care about the consequences yeah do you all do you all think that we have the capacity within within w- every human being has the capacity to do not necessarily the evil things that these serial killers have done but things that you know that are you know Bad. i don't want to say murder mm-hmm. but um to that ex- yeah to that point i kind of think that like we're all just on this like the neutral spectrum mm-hmm. and of course as you grow up you kind of lean one way or the other so i mean it, it kind of ties back to the whole nature versus nurture mm-hmm. thing i think yeah. yeah i think it also ties back to specific situations that occur mm-hmm uh-huh. Like if you're put into a situation where you you're forced to be a certain way, mm-hmm. right? There's another book called The Lucifer Effect by Philip Zimbardo, um, and it explores the Sanford Pearson experiment. It also explores uh, some atrocities that were done um, uh, by like some military personnel in overseas, um, and how they they dehumanized um, like local citizens and things like that. Um, and they and the Stanford prison experiment, what it is, is that it was an experiment to uh, over con- like power, right? So some were made guards, some were made prisoners, all fake. Uh, but the guards, people, individuals that were guards, they started to exert and show tendencies of like abuse, abuse their power, yeah, right? abusing mm-hmm. their power. And so that's kind of really what I'm saying, um, about, uh, do we all have the capacity to do certain things if we're in a situation i i yeah i think if we're forced to um or if either by like society Mm -hmm. or social like social situations or a trauma that we endure that just rewires our brain Mm -hmm. yeah I, i i think i think we can in the same vein though you could definitely argue like there are people who have been through the worst of the worst Mm -hmm. of humanity you know war um Mm -hmm. bombings but Mm -hmm. they end up being just the most you know just the nicest humans the most sympathetic the most helpful Mm -hmm. um yeah not saying you can't you know you you have to come out on top and be the bigger person like if you went through stuff like that i think you would be allowed to be a little bit angry a little bit cynical Mm -hmm. yeah angry but but not like murder someone not murder like (laughs) angry but (laughs) like sometimes sometimes actions are justifiable you know I, I think so. I think that's more than valid. The things that these serial killers did, uh, no, nope. definitely not justifiable. Definitely not. Yeah. Let's reiterate one more time: not justifiable. Like, not justifiable. At all. These guys, freaking insane. Yeah. Yep. No. <laughs> uh, I guess I don't. If there's time being, there was just one more question that I was interested in asking. Uh, so, General, if you were to meet Johnny Douglas, what questions would you ask him about his experiences or the insights he gained from working with serial killers? If any of his perspectives have changed, like, from then till now, as far as, like, you know, are you still pro... I'm I'm pretty sure he would be, but are you still pro-death penalty? Have your thoughts on any of these serial killers, you know, changed? Would Mm -hmm. you still try to use profiling as a big tool? Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Just to see how it's changed from back then Mm -hmm. and now. Yeah. Um, I think one question that I would have for him, um, would you say it's easier to catch individuals um with this new technology that we have mm, that's or good. is it more difficult because now these some of these serial killers they watch the news they mm-hmm. keep up with mm-hmm. certain trends mm-hmm. they keep up with technology um is it easier or is it more difficult also 
you know, what preventative measures can be taken, you know, if an if a child or youth is doing arson mm-hmm. or if they are being cruel to animals, you know, what kind of conversations should we be having? Mm-hmm. Or what if that's changed? Like what are their modern day signs now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Like it could be over like online, like bullying, like mm-hmm. excessive, you know, intense bullying of an individual or individuals. Yeah, that's that's a good point. That's really. Did yeah. you have anything you would ask him? Uh, my question, uh, what was from our uh, the reader that shared with us earlier? Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought the exact same thing. How he kept saying that, oh, it's a white male. It's always a white mm-hmm, male, mm-hmm. but he never explained why. So I had that mm. exact same question. I was I just kept reading the book and I was like, okay, why? Why are there no female serial killers, you know, who are doing these terrible things? Because they don't get caught. Who are mutilating uh, men's bodies, you know, um, or treating men's bodies very in this dehumanizing way, the way that these white men are doing, you know? Right. Like, why? Why mm-hmm. is that? Why is that a reason? I think there's definitely an answer for that. Um, and I, I, w- I would be interested to to hear what he has to say. But uh, Rosanna, you make a good point because they haven't been caught, <laughs> you know, like the Zodiac killer. I mean, he, he had they, that individual hasn't been caught. Mm-hmm. It's a woman. Yeah, Rosanna. it, c- it could you... be. It could be. We don't know. But um, like there's there's high profile serial killers out there. Like one of the top ones yeah. is probably Eileen. Oh, Rose. yeah. You know, but she's... I mean, did they have it coming? No, I'm just kidding. Ex- no, the reason why. Like, it's a joke. Like, de- <laughs> like me and my friends, we've talked about that. And we're like, did they have it coming, though? <laughs> It's another thing of like, mm-hmm. you can't justify it, but you can understand like the reasoning behind it. Yeah, you know? I mean, like it's just like comparing to some of the serial killers that it was mentioned in this book when they just randomly chose that one woman mm-hmm. who was walking down the stairs on her way to work. You know, right? They just happened to be in that state of mind at the time, and yeah. guess who walks on like by? where he was like, yeah, no, this person wasn't targeted. They were simply just there at the wrong time. Exactly. It's there's something to think about. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely and that's kind of something that's mm-hmm. kind of talked about in society now like when things happen it tends to lean towards caucasian males most of the time being the perpetrators mm-hmm. yeah definitely a book that uh i would like to recommend to our readers um it is fiction it's a fiction book it's called the lovely bones mm. um it is available on cloud library uh, audiobook and ebook um and it goes it, it does go over like a serial killer um and it's just a very interesting read um, it's all fiction. Um, might be a little bit difficult to read, but I definitely recommend it. I think the author does a great job of presenting the the perspective of the serial killer and also the victim um, in an interesting way. And it's also a movie. But uh, any final thoughts that we wanted to go over? No, just interesting read. Definitely read at your own pace. I mm-hmm. felt uh, yeah. we were reading at our own pace um, just to try to really comprehend everything that was going on. Definitely uh all those warnings you know after right. reading do whatever it takes to regain your mental health because reading i mean true crime is really big right now mm-hmm. everyone is obsessing over true crime so many podcasters so many movies so many shows so much books you know you can really just delve into it uh and it's very interesting we are very curious to know why and to know about everything that happens um but I mean, I, I just definitely recommend taking a break from it sometimes, too. You know, to kind of piggyback on that, the whole everyone's into um, true, true crime. crime, just real quick. It We talked about how serial killers, they detach themselves from, you know, the people and the details. Mm-hmm. Do you think we as a society, like fascinated by true crime, that's kind of how we process all of this? We detach ourselves yes. from what's going on there. So that way we don't, you know, we're not weighed down with the. Yeah. I think me personally, I do that. That's why I, I'm like, I need to detach myself like from consuming all of this uh, every now and then, even mm-hmm. though I am interested and fascinated in it. But it it's, yeah. <laughs> things to think about. So uh, thanks for joining us on this book talk. Once again, the book was Mindhunter and it is available on e- on Cloud Library in ebook and audiobook format. Uh, make sure you stay up to date with our Instagram page for uh, when we post the next book talk should be coming up fairly soon so just keep an eye out for that and of course we welcome any readers anyone with thoughts to go ahead and participate you know message us on Instagram or at our email at bibliotechonair at gmail.com <laughs>